May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. The story in today's Gospel takes place in Jerusalem in the week following the triumphal entry into the city. Jesus is once again in a setting of controversy with the religious authorities. They are motivated by their desire to demonstrate that this run-of-the-mill country bumpkin miracle worker is neither a scholar nor a true prophet. They are eager to trip him up and to demonstrate their superior understanding of the law, to embarrass him in front they'd have been really pleased. Matthew tells us that a lawyer asks, asks the question, which commandment in the law is the greatest? It's a fundamental question, one worthy of a lengthy debate then or now. Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This answer, known as the great commandment, should be very familiar to us because the story appears in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I'd like to address briefly some nuances. First, when Jesus says that the second commandment is like the first one, he is insisting that there is no separation between the two commandments. They are equal. It focuses on the way in which loving God can find practical expression. Failing to honor the second commandment while claiming to observe the first makes one a liar. Both public worship and private piety, when divorced from justice and mercy, cannot stand alone. Excluding your neighbor from your care and concern is not an option if you claim to love God. The second commandment is also a form of the golden rule, which exists in many, many religious and cultural traditions. Second, just as the two commandments cannot be separated from one another, neither is to be outweighed by the other. For example, understanding and carrying out the mandate to love one's neighbor through acts of service to others is not sufficient. It doesn't mean that the first commandment to love God doesn't have to be observed. There are ways of loving God that go beyond loving one's neighbor. Prayer, worship, the thoughtful search for truth, and a serious wrestling of issues of faith are essential to understanding ourselves in relationship to God, essential to worshiping and loving God. Third, for Matthew, Jesus is the one supreme interpreter of the law, and here Jesus declares that the love of God and the love of neighbors are the keys to interpreting all the laws and the prophets. Both commands come from the law, of course. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5 read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 reads, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. By selecting these two commandments, Jesus does not decrease our obligations. Instead, he makes them more radical and comprehensive. What we owe to God is not tied to carrying out one specific law, but rather to living into the law with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
Jesus tells us that love's claims have no limits. This is the lens we are to use to examine our actions. So that's good, right? Jesus boiled it all down for us, and following these two commandments should be easy peasy, right? Instead, from the very beginning, Christians have wrestled with how to reconcile the great commandment. Much of what Paul wrote about in his letters was addressing the inevitable arguments. Do faithful followers of Jesus need to be circumcised? Do they need to follow the dietary restrictions laid out in the law? Do they need to observe the Sabbath? Can they be women? What is necessary to loving God? What can be separated from law and tradition? What is essential? I have a few thoughts about the difficulties we encounter in trying to reconcile the great commandment with our lives today. I've noticed that some people try to get around the great commandment by saying that they love the sinner but hate the sin. I've noticed that this is never applied to infamous historical sinners like Hitler and Stalin or those who carry out mass shootings today. Most people are happy to leave the job of loving them to God alone. Instead, they apply it to people that they claim to want to build loving relationships with. If only they'd stop being gay or uppity or feminists. Without considering that that is how they were created by God, without considering the radical act of loving your neighbor as yourself, without restriction. Many years ago, when I was in middle school, I had a close friend whose family worshipped at the Trinity Ch College Chapel. He was scandalized that money was being spent on some new carved oak fixtures there, rather than on some other charitable cause, even as he admitted that the work was quite beautiful. We argued about it over some months, and because we were 13 or so, never really resolved the conundrum. I think my answer to him today would go something along the lines of, these sacred spaces that humans create not only feed their religious communities, providing refuge, peace, and restoration, but also in their construction quite literally feed the artisans who create them. Much of the world's art, music, and architecture has been created in an effort to express how to love, in, or, in an effort to express love for God. But it has also created ways for people to make a living. On TikTok, there's a bouncy young woman, a historian who takes us all over England, showing us all kinds of cool things. And I watched one of these videos recently, and I learned the word misericord, which means pity of the heart. It's the name for a small wooden structure on the underside of a folded seat, folding seat in a church, which when the seat is folded up is intended to act as a shelf to support a person in a partially standing position during long periods of prayer. They're also called mercy seats. Misericords were, were first created about a thousand years ago and spread widely across Europe. In Western European medieval and later churches, they often featured detailed carvings, while simpler, less ornate ones exist in Orthodox churches. They were created in an effort to love those whose worship responsibilities, a way of loving God, might involve hours of standing by giving them a way to take the pressure off their feet. I think the misericord is a great example of trying to balance how to love both God and your neighbor. Because the church is a flawed human institution, a lot of people will say something like, oh, I love Jesus, or I love what Jesus says, and then they continue, it's just Christians or the church that I can't stand which is very disappointing. 
especially since I think all of us here today can admit to feeling that way sometimes ourselves. Why do we get out of bed on a rainy Sunday when we'd rather sleep in and go to brunch? Why do we work to maintain unwieldy historic buildings when people beg in the streets? Why do we have to put up with those who claim to follow Jesus but seem to be dedicated to hating their neighbors in a variety of ways? I don't have answers for a lot of this, except to say that I know that this is a place where I not only find community, a place to love my neighbor, community with other people who struggle with these questions, but I also more readily connect to God to focus my heart and my mind on the ways that God sustains me. Worship grounds me and helps me go into the world each week to do my best to balance the twin demands of the great commandment. I hope that it helps you too.